and I have the pleasure of welcoming you as today's worship associate. Welcome to First Unitarian Church of Wilmington, Delaware. It is a my Byron, good morning. Not yet. Let's double check, make sure I'm on. This is Karen. Oh, battery. battery. Try again? Okay, try again. Ah, wonderful. Thank you. Thanks for your help. Good morning. I'm Helen Foss, and I have the pleasure of welcoming you as today's worship associate. Welcome to First Unitarian Church of Wilmington, Delaware. Welcome to all of you who are here in, the sanct in person in the sanctuary this morning, and welcome to each of you at home who are joining us online. Welcome to you all, no matter the hue of your skin or the origin of your ethnicity. Welcome whomever you love and wherever you are on your spiritual journey. You are welcome here. If you're new to First Unitarian, I invite you to check out our website. It's firstuuwilm.org to learn more about us and to sign up for our email newsletter that'll come to you every Friday in your inbox. I'm looking forward to Reverend Larry's sermon this morning. I hope some of you had the chance to see the movie Freud's Last Session in preparation for this morning but it's not absolutely necessary to have seen the movie. Our service today will include some readings from the screenplay. Unfortunately, I was down for the count with sciatica, so I did my own reflection on my journey with the idea of God. <clears throat> Sorting out the idea of God and my growing spirituality. And now I'm looking forward to hearing Reverend Larry's take on this intriguing idea. Let's now prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Good morning. As you know, I'm the Reverend Larry Pierce. And as you guessed, I have the joy of being minister here at First Unitarian Church of Wilmington. 
Thank you, Kathy, for that selection from the Chronicles of Narnia. And I'm so excited that we get to hear from the First Unitarian Women's Choir today. I'm going to contain my excitement. <laughs> I'm going to try to contain my excitement. Helen and I will now do a responsive call to worship. You'll be reading the parts that are designated for the congregation uh, with Helen, and I'll read the parts designated for the minister. This is a selection from Kenneth Patton entitled, Let Us Worship. Let us worship with our eyes and ears and fingertips. Let us love the world through heart and mind and body. We feed our eyes upon the mystery and revelation in the faces of our brothers, sisters, siblings. We seek to know the wistfulness of the very young and the very old, and the wistfulness of people in all times of life. We seek to understand the shyness behind arrogance, the fear behind pride, the tenderness behind clumsy strength, and the anguish behind cruelty. All life flows into a great common life, and if we will only open our eyes to our companions. Let us worship, not in bowing down, not with closed eyes, eyes and stopped ears. Let us worship with the opening of all the windows of our beings, with the full outstretching of our spirits. Life comes with singing and laughter, with tears and confiding, with a rising wave to, to, too great to be held in the mind and heart and body to those who have fallen in love with life. Let us worship and let us learn to love. If you have a chalice at home, I invite you to light it as Reverend Larry lights our sanctuary chalice while I read these words by UU Minister Reverend Jennifer Grayson. Drawn together, we come together every week bound not by a creed or a mutual desire to please one God or many gods, Yet we are drawn together by a belief that how we are in the world, who we are together, matters. We light this chalice together in the knowledge that love, not fear, can change this world. Please rise now as you're willing and able to sing hymn 1008, When Our Heart Is In A Holy Place, after which we will remain standing for our unison affirmation. Thank you. 
Please now join me in affirming our mission. First Unitarian Church of Wilmington is a beloved community that nourishes minds and spirits, fights injustice, and transforms the world through loving action. Our brief prayer this morning is from Soren Kierkegaard. Let's feel our feet upon the earth. Let's feel the miracle of our toes touching the earth if they can reach that far. Let's feel the earth's embrace of who we are in this moment as we receive this breath so freely given to us and so beautifully received. Kierkegaard wrote, I found I had less and less to say until finally I became silent and began to listen. I discovered in the silence the voice of God. So let us join now in a silence in which we can pay attention to whatever we're holding in our own heart this day. Whatever weighs on our heart, whatever fills our heart with joy, let them be alongside of one another. And may we embrace and feel embraced by this shared silence that follows. In a moment, I will ask you to speak aloud in this room if you care to do so, or write in the chat, whatever might be weighing on your own heart as a concern that you have for our world, a loved one, or yourself. What concerns do you have this morning? Amid the concerns that you have, do you have tucked in there at least a sliver of joy that you'd like to share so that we can share with you whatever joy you may be holding? Is there some joy that you'd like to share? So may all whose names were spoken and those unspoken find peace and healing this day as we join together in a musical meditation.
<clears throat> so we have a reading this morning excerpted from Freud's last session. This scene is Freud's study. Freud's writing at his desk. It's crowded with dozens of statuettes. And there's a sound of barking and then the doorbell and he looks over at the clock on a curio-filled shelf, 11.25. He rises and walks toward his study door. Yofi, you hear someone coming? Smart dog. Yofi, come here. Yofi, run to Papa. Or just sit there. Dr. Freud, I'm... Uh, Professor Lewis. I had given up on you for lost. What kind of dog is he? A chow, highly intelligent. He's my assistant. Really? Yeah, really. He stays with me through all my sessions. Yofi is my emotional barometer. How so? If a patient is calm, he stretches out at my feet. But if a patient is agitated, Yofi stands by my side and never takes his eyes off him. How interesting. What should I make of him running away at the sight of me? <laughs> he too is a fanatic for punctuality. Of course, I'm terribly sorry to be so late. All the trains were filled with children being evacuated to the country. Have you been listening to the radio? I always listen to the radio. I find it convenient to be warned before getting bombed. I have other engagements, so our visit must be brief. Uh, perhaps should we postpone? Until when, Professor? Until <clears throat> when? Do you count on your tomorrows? Because I do not. Of course. You British people, you say, of course, numerous times in conversation, of course. Why is that? What does it mean? I don't know. Habit, I suppose. Interesting. Two opposite personalities from different backgrounds, different <coughs> national traits, and tragic histories. A clock chimes quietly from some distant room. Lewis crosses to the window. He looks out at the garden. You have a lovely home. Yes, my daughter Anna has done her best to replicate our home in Vienna. Uh, you too uh, are not a native of this country, am I correct? I was born in Belfast, but I've been here since I was sent to boarding school at 13. Your Irish will always win out. We all try so valiantly to leave our past, our childhood, but they will never leave us nor the sorrows of the world. Uh, this will never be my home. But since we have so little time, we should come to the reason I wrote to you. Of course, my book, Pilgrim's Regress. It's a parody, yes. A parody on Pilgrim's Progress, yes? Yes. A clever idea if anyone still reads Milton. I understand that what I've written offends you. Offends me? Why? My satirizing you with the Sigmund character, bombastic, vain, ignorant. Perhaps I was overzealous. I'm sorry if you took it as a personal attack, but I can't apologize for challenging your worldview when it completely negates my own. Which is? That there is a God, <clears throat> that a man doesn't have to be an imbecile to believe that, and those of us who do aren't suffering from an obsessional neurosis. Oh, I've never read your book. Uh, tea? No, thank you. Oh, good. It must be cold now. Uh, Professor Lewis, if you disagree so strongly with my views, why did you come here to see me? Not all of them. When I was a student, we devoured your every book to discover our latent perversions. <laughs> <clears throat> And I was shocked when I read you declared Pilgrim's Progress a work of genius. Seriously? A clash between God and Satan? I didn't say whose side I was on. 
You've insisted all your life that the very concept of God was ludicrous. Yes. So why do you care that I think if you're satisfied? In, why do you care what I think if you're satisfied in your disbelief? Why am I here? For one reason, I want to learn why a man of your supreme intellect could suddenly abandon truth and embrace an insidious lie. What if it isn't a lie? Have you considered how terrifying it would be to realize you're wrong? Far less terrifying than it would be for you. You said earlier that you challenge my worldview, my belief in disbelief. I do. My colleague, Eric Larson, knows a colleague of yours, a Mr. Tolkien. Yes, we're close friends. What exactly are inklings? It's what we call our literary group at Oxford. We discuss each other's works. These are fantasies? Often, yes. I have spent much of my life examining fantasies. In the time I have left, I am determined to understand what I can of reality. Your parents, did they inject you with this fairy tale faith? No, my faith ended with my childhood. I buried it along with my mother. She died when I was quite young. My father was consumed with grief, unable to process it or to take ours into account. His only solution was to send us off to England for boarding school. It's probably my life's greatest trauma, more than the war. But then on my next birthday, my brother Warren gave me the most wonderful present I'd ever been given, a new world, a toy forest he created in a biscuit box, moss, twigs, tiny stones, and flowers. I thought it was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. I still do. The moment I saw it, it created a yearning I never felt before. I called that feeling joy, and I still do. And this joy you equate with an inherent desire for a creator? Yes. You were led to God by a biscuit tin? <laughs> Our deepest cravings are never satisfied or even identified. In German, we call it Sinnsucht, a longing. All my years I have felt this. The same anger you feel toward a God that does nothing, the wish that God doesn't exist can be just as powerful as the belief that he does. Critically as, a liter critically, as a literary historian, I'm perfectly convinced that whatever the Gospels are, they aren't myths. They aren't artistic enough. They're clumsy. Most of the life of Jesus is left totally unknown to us, and writers building a legend wouldn't allow that to happen. You are convinced of Christ's existence because of bad storytelling? Christ's existence isn't in doubt, only who he was. The man was chronicled by his contemporaries and historians. Even H.G. Wells, whose skepticism rivaled my own, admitted, here was a man, this part of the tale could not have been invented. That Christ was a man, I don't argue. The same as B Muhammad or Buddha. Ah, but only Christ made the appalling claim to be the Messiah. He also claimed the power to forgive sins. How absurd is that? I am convinced Christ was a lunatic. <laughs> Why should I take Christ's claim to be God more seriously than the dozen patients I have treated who claim to be Christ? Well, did you find a single person whose concept of reality was otherwise sound? No. So if Christ was not a lunatic, it forced me to consider the only choice I was left with. On my way to the London Zoo, my decision came as naturally as I decided to wear trousers that morning. It was that simple. Things are simple only when you choose not to examine them. Some things can be accepted. I'm here before you, am I not? That's how plainly obvious this was. But you're asking for the same to be true of others. BBC announcer, you've been listening to a broadcast from 10 Downing Street. So it begins. Again. The first war taught me nothing. I underestimated Hitler. 
Everyone did. It's hard to believe such a hideous man exists. I've found little that is good about human beings. In my experience, mankind is Earth's litter. <coughs> Whether they publicly subscribe to this or that ethical doctrine, something better not to say aloud or even think. An optimist, are you? <laughs> Battling Bibles. Love your neighbors as yourselves. You heard the radio. It's simple-minded impossibility. I disagree. Of course you do. Your faith <coughs> collapses otherwise. The turn the other cheek. Uh, should Poland turn the other cheek to Hitler? Should they love their neighbors as German tanks crush their homes? Do you think it coincidence? that Jesus demands his followers must be like children to enter heaven. It's because man has never matured enough to face that he is alone in the universe, and religion makes the world his nursery. I have two words for you. Grow up. What would you call a confirmed non-believer whose desk is guarded by gods and goddesses? A collector. I am simply interested in ancient belief systems, yours included. All sharing similar concepts, right and wrong, good and evil, and a choice between them. And if good is to be chosen, then your God who created it also created evil, allowed Lucifer to live, to flourish, even when he logically could have been destroyed. God gave Lucifer free will, which is the only thing that makes goodness possible. A world filled with choiceless creatures is a world of machines. It's men, not God, who created prisons, slavery, bombs. Man's suffering is the fault of the man. Is that your excuse for pain and suffering? Did I bring about my own cancer? Or is killing me God's revenge? I don't know. You don't know. And I don't pretend to. It's the most difficult question of all, isn't it? If God is good, he would make his creatures perfectly happy, but we aren't. So God lacks goodness or power or both. Uh, finally, we are making progress. What if God wants to perfect us through suffering? Make us realize that real happiness, eternal happiness, can only come through him. If pleasure is his whisper, pain is his megaphone. We speak different languages. You believe in the revelation I believe in science, the authority of reason. There is no common ground. There is also the dictatorship of pride. Why does religion make room for science, but science refuses to make room for religion? Oh, how roomy was Galileo's cell when he first told the Pope the sun did not move around the earth? <laughs> okay, the stupidity of church leaders is too easy a target. There's a train back to Oxford in an hour. I'm sorry to have disappointed you. The offense was mine. I didn't say offense. I said I disappointed you. My idea of God, it constantly changes. He shatters it again and again. Still, I feel the world is crowded with him. He's everywhere, incognito. And his incognito, it's so hard to penetrate. The real struggle is to keep trying, to come awake and stay awake. One of us is a fool. If you are right, you will be able to tell me so. If I am right, neither of us will ever know. <laughs> Death is as unfair as life. Goodbye, Professor. We will meet again, perhaps. God willing. Oh, <laughs> wait. Do you remember that joke in my book about the pastor and the village atheist? No. The village atheist was an insurance agent. He asked the local pastor if he would make a sick call. The atheist's family was astonished. They couldn't believe he had the strength to speak with the pastor of all people. All day, the two men are quarreled, and then all night. Finally, at dawn, the weary pastor stumbled from the house, the villager had died, still an atheist, but the pastor was fully insured. 
Now that is funny. If only there were such a thing. Humor? Insurance. <clears throat> Thank you, guys. So, I am sure you've ho heard this joke about Unitarian Universalists. If they were at a crossroads and one sign said, heaven, and the other side said, a discussion about heaven, <laughs> that Unitarian Universalists would go to the discussion about heaven. I have a variation on that. If, there, if Unitarians, if you were at a crossroads and there was a sign that said, this way to God, this way to a discussion about God, which road would you take? I can imagine there might be actually a traffic jam. People would be stymied by asking, well, what do you mean about God? <laughs> or why a discussion about God? I can even imagine some people asking before they decide, will there be coffee? Will there be snacks? I can imagine my own latte getting cold as I'm standing there waiting for people to sort themselves out. I can imagine myself taking either road, and I can even imagine some in the group going in neither direction. Unitarian Universalists love to poke fun at themselves. Given the humorless religions that some of us grew up in, it is a relief to enjoy a little self-deprecating humor. Humor is also a good way to step back and look at ourselves. This kind of humor can be a healthy tendency. Our humor about ourselves can also be misleading at times. It could come across that Unitarian Universalists don't take their religion seriously enough, that we don't actually believe anything, or that we've fallen prey to that viral statement Oh, Unitarian Universalists can believe whatever they want, which has sometimes conveyed the message that it really doesn't matter what we believe. Now, but that's a whole other sermon. I've given some sermons on that on more than one occasion, and so I'm not going to rerun that topic right now, but I do have a pop quiz <laughs> from a previous sermon. If you hear someone saying, Unitarian Universalists can believe whatever they want, how might you respond? If you answer correctly, you can have all the snacks you want <laughs> at the fellowship hour today. Okay, I guess I have to do a little review. You just ask in a curious way, anything? and let that begin a conversation. I once got excited about going to an actual discussion on God among Unitarian Universalists. They were going to focus on the book, God Revised, How Religion Must Evolve in a Scientific Age. The book was written by a colleague of mine, Galen Gingrich, who's minister at All Souls Unitarian Church in New York, New York City. Now, I had read the book, I was ready to dive right into the discussion, so got there, and after all the introductions, and everybody got their snacks, and just as the discussion was about to begin, I was pumped. And then someone began by saying, why did he have to use the word God? <laughs> Others chimed in. Yeah, I just couldn't go there, they said, and other heads were nodding. Now, it wasn't as if they were actually wanting to answer the question. They just wanted to diss the author for the word that he chose to use. Now, I went from pumped to deflated. In a matter of seconds, it was as if inside of me, with my own excitement for this conversation, I had thrown out a lot of confetti and just as the discussion was beginning, I was bringing all the confetti back within and sucking it in. 
I'd already devoted myself to a big bowl of popcorn and an apple cider. So although part of me wanted to leave right at that moment, I was dedicated to my snacks. <laughs> Maybe this initial conversation was only a preview of things to come, coming attractions. Maybe the actual movie would be more interesting. It wasn't. So in the book, Galen talks intimately about his own religious journey growing up as a Mennonite among an extended family of Mennonites in Lancaster County. He shares how gradually over time he came to reconstruct his theology and his understanding, influenced by contemporary theologians and scientists. And his connection to the religion of his upbringing was beginning to fade away as some new convictions were arising in him that made him feel at home in the world in a distinctly different way. The comments by others in the group made it clear to me they hadn't even gotten that far into the book. The professor in me wanted to say, well, you know, remember Galen quotes his former colleague, Forrester Church, who said, the power which I cannot explain or know or name I call God, God is not God's name. God is my name for the mystery that looms within and arches beyond the limits of my being. Instead, I put my, my professor side aside. I put a whole full handful of popcorn into my mouth and I watched the show. I guess we all went to that particular discussion for the snacks. In the screenplay <clears throat> for its last session that we just heard excerpts from this morning, there is a discussion and some opinions shared about God. The scene's not based necessarily on a real encounter between Freud and C.S. Lewis, um, but there is some evidence that there was a professor from Oxford who came to meet with, with Freud toward the end of his life. For some, all the signs point to that someone, that professor being C.S. Lewis. Even if the actual conversation was imaginary, the facts are that C.S. Lewis had read much of Freud's work. <clears throat> At the time, psychoanalysis was a a way for doing literary criticism, and C.S. Lewis had certainly kept up with his field and knew much of what was available. And actually, as you heard in the reading, Lewis had written a book that was a satire or a parody on Freud, Paradise Regress, in which the main character is Sigismund, which was Freud's actual name before he changed it to Sigmund. And Freud had most likely read some of C.S. Lewis's work which narrated Lewis's journey from atheism to theism to Christianity. So it's fair to say that a dialogue actually did take place between the two men, at least internally, within each of them, if, even if they never met in person. What we are observing in the screenplay is an interaction between two men, each with their own complicated biographies, and each with their own apparently conflicted and opposing worldviews. Freud's worldview, of course, is that of a materialist. The materialist worldview, generally speaking, is that the universe is all there is. Life is just here by chance. What we can actually observe, that is what is real, and reason and the scientific method will help us understand what is real and come closer to the truth. Sound familiar? <clears throat> Freud wrote, there are no sources of knowledge of the universe other than carefully scrutinized observations. In other words, what we call research. And alongside it, no knowledge is derived from revelation. Freud argues that the scientific method, at least as he understood it at his time, was our only source of knowledge. C.S. Lewis's worldview could be called a spiritual worldview that could incorporate an understanding that there is an intelligence that gives order to life and gives life meaning. And in this spiritual worldview, there's a place for revelation, conversion, 
and personal transformation. Lewis disagrees with Freud, and he argues that, and I quote, the scientific method simply cannot answer all questions. It cannot be the source of all knowledge. He says that the job of science, a very important and necessary job, is to experiment and to observe and to report how things behave or react. Lewis writes, but why anything comes to be there at all and whether there is anything behind the things that science observes, this is not a scientific question. <clears throat> so the screenplay imagines that the two have come together because of their different oppositional worldviews and because there is an underlying curiosity that Freud has about his former atheist literary scholar turned Christian Lewis. How? Could this be? <clears throat> One gets a sense that this is indeed close to the end of Freud's life because of his cancer and that perhaps Freud might want to have just one more round at these questions about God before he does or does not meet his maker. <clears throat> in actuality and in the course of the unfolding story of the screenplay, we discover that there is more complexity to the situation. The screenplay is based on a play by the same name, and the play is based on a book by Harvard psychiatrist Armin Nicoli, The Question of God, which is based on a course that Nicoli taught for a number of years at Harvard. <clears throat> in the book, Nicoli reveals that the question of God was one that Freud gave attention to for most of his life. Freud's public writings include Totem and Taboo, Moses and Monotheism, and The Future of an Illusion, and they give the view that one's personal belief in God could be related to one's relationship to one's father and to authority. I'm losing some of you now as you start kind of pondering that, so come on back. <clears throat> At the level of human civilization, Freud discusses belief in God as an example of what he calls wish fulfillment, related to the time when, as helpless and vulnerable children, we all needed some reassurance of a father figure or someone outside of ourselves that would protect us, care for us, and intervene when we needed them the most. Freud's public writings delve into this theory of the origin of religion morality and religious psychology more than I have time to do now. I'm sure some of you are relieved by that. <clears throat> but interestingly enough, Nicole, Nicole also discloses his conversation with Anna Freud, Freud's daughter, who also became a psychoanalyst. During one of her visits at Harvard, she told Nicole, if you want to know what Freud really thought, you should rely on, you should not rely on his biographies or his books. Read his letters. So that's exactly what Nicoli did. And he discovers that Freud often in his letters quotes from the Bible, uses such words and phrases as with God's help, God willing, grace, God's judgment, and my secret prayer. Nicoli discovers that in his letters during college, Freud often makes arguments for God and states that the most important question a person can ask themselves is, does God exist? Now, certainly what comes across in Nicoli's book and the screenplay is that Freud does not seem to have a fascination with the question, does seem, I'm sorry, to have a fascination with the question of God in his books as well as in his ongoing personal conversations with Lewis. In the screenplay, Lewis almost goes to sit on the analyst's couch until Freud redirects him and says, not there. But if we were to put Freud and Lewis on the analyst's couch for just a spell, we'd discover that indeed both had difficult relationships with their fathers and that this may have impacted their oppositional views of God, at least initially. Freud's father was an Orthodox Jew, and Freud was embarrassed by his father's behavior, who incidentally was several years older than Freud's mother and could have been 
old enough to be his grandfather. His father told his son that one day when he was walking down the street, an anti-Semite knocked off his father's hat and it fell into the mud and, it, and the person ridiculed his father. When the son, Sig Sigmund, asked his father, what did you do in response? His father said he simply picked up his hat and walked away. For Sigmund, this was a weakness that the younger Freud felt his father had that extended to other areas of his life as well. His father struggled financially, couldn't afford to pay for Sigmund's uh, medical school, and perhaps relied so much on his orthodox faith more than Sigmund would have liked. C.S. Lewis's relationship with his father was also problematic. Interested? He often told the story that when his mother died, when he was nine years old, his father provided no comfort at all, no abiding presence. Instead, uh, he took his grief-stricken sons and immediately sent them away from the family home in Belfast to a series of boarding schools in England. And the schools were unfortunately uh, not the best environment for them. Moreover, C.S. Lewis felt he could never really talk to his father without it resulting in an argument. Lewis's rejection of religion was as much a rejection of what seemed to be meaningless and loveless in his early life. He wrote that the obligatory worship services that he had to attend, attend as a boarding school student were a convenient way to catch a nap. <clears throat> I'm just scanning the sanctuary a little bit right now just to see how prevalent that practice might be. <clears throat> it could be that these early childhood experiences led to each his rejection of a father God or to their complicated understanding of God. It could be that each were originally drawn to a materialist worldview early on with some hope that it would give them assurance of what they could actually put their trust in, observable facts and reason, rather than messy sentiments and possible revelations. Yet as we know, something shifted in C.S. Lewis. The result of his conversions with, conversations with people whose intelligence and creativity he might, admired, one of those being J.R. Tolkien, the Lord of the Rings fame, in his own reading of the New Testament, C.S. Lewis gradually shifted from the place of having a closed door to the question of God, to the gradual opening of that door. Upon reflection of his life, as he describes in the screenplay in his autobiography, he had an early childhood memory of a miniature forest, a miniature magical forest of sorts that was assembled on the top of a biscuit tin, a cookie tin that his brother had made for him. This forest gave the young Lewis such joy. Retrospectively, he recognized a desire and a longing for something that had existed from his early life and throughout his life. Eventually, he was able to connect that desire and that joy from that miniature forest um, as what eventually led him to God. This brings to mind the phrase from Augustine, our heart is restless until it rests in you. Lewis's autobiography, as you may know, is entitled, Surprised by Joy. Since in it, he talks about his gradual unfolding to a life of belief in God. Now, Lewis did not want to believe in God. He felt that the reality of God would mean that there would be an interference in his own life, a limit on his own freedom. He felt that his prayers were like posting letters to a non-existent address until all of that changed gradually and surprisingly for C.S. Lewis in a way that he could not fully or adequately describe to satisfy Freud. Indeed, C.S. Lewis called himself a reluctant convert who did not want to meet God. Now, another area of difference between the two men was this whole idea of a moral law. For Lewis, this was given to us by God to discover. Lewis said, it's inside information. You find out more about God from the moral law than from the universe in general. Just as you find out 
more about a man by listening to his conversation than by looking at a house he has built. It doesn't surprise us that Freud, what Freud felt about moral law, he felt about it the same way he felt about God. It was all created by the human, not by God. Freud felt that intelligent, reasonable people could figure out morality themselves without any divine guidance or infusion. Of course, at the time of this play, Freud's idea was put to the test. You see, Freud had only recently just escaped to England from the Nazis who had burned his books and denounced his theories of psychoanalysis. His life was in danger. By the way, many of those, many so-called intelligent, reasonable men and women became part of this Nazi movement. So there was that contradiction from his own theory that reasonable and intelligent people would know what to do morally. At the same time, he had the contradiction of his own vivid experience at the time. You following what I'm saying here? Okay. Those of you who aren't napping, are you following what I'm saying? Okay. I think the message of this screenplay is that there's perhaps a bit of both the materialist and the spiritualist within each of us. The two may actually meet within us as an inner dialogue if we are available to it. There will be times when we take a realistic, reasoned, rational approach to life, and it serves us well. It helps us to get through and to stay grounded, to do things, and to feel we have things figured out or a way to figure things out. And there are times when we, too, are surprised by joy. There are times when we find ourselves experiencing something within life that is more than just the facts. We sense the wonder in the everyday. We sense the awesomeness of the fact that we just are and that there is such a thing as life. There are moments when we seem to awaken from the sleep that we are in and we are bathed with the awesomeness of it all. Science can be a source of appreciating mystery, as can our momentary experiences and revelations of transcendence. How many of you are wearing blue today? Just stand up if you're willing and able or raise your hand. Okay. Now, look around and just notice that blueness can mean many different things. So when we ask, what do we mean by blue? We can recognize that there are many shades and variations of blueness. You can have a seat. Likewise, if we ask, what do you mean by God? What do you mean by that God you believe in or don't believe in? We might discover in our conversations that there are many shades and variations of understanding of God. If we say that love doesn't exist, then we might be cutting ourselves off from an experience, a deep experience of what it means to be human. And likewise, if we simply say that the divine doesn't exist, we might be cutting ourselves off from an experience that is available to us all. So let's appreciate both aspects, both of those voices within us, the materialist and the spiritual, and allow them to have that inner dialogue. Larry, what about that question at the beginning of the sermon? What was that question? Something about did God believe in Freud? Remember that question? I think I should answer it. So if I imagine that if I ask God the question, she would reply in her sassy self and say, it depends. <laughs> it depends on what you mean by believe. And she would say, it depends. What do you mean by Freud?
Hello and good morning. My name is Jackie Lukowski. I'm here to talk to you today about our Children and Youth Religious Exploration Program. I'm on the CYRE committee as well as being a member of the board. And I apologize for not being there in person, but I'm upstairs helping with the children in the Age of Reason program this morning. So anyway, we have 45 children and youth registered this year, which is very exciting. They bring a lot of energy and fun to the church. You'll see them on the second Sunday of each month, and they start off in the sanctuary that week and then go up to their respective classrooms. On all other Sundays, they start in Bruner Chapel and have a children's worship service before breaking into their small groups. So our Chalice children, who are three years old up to kindergarten, are focusing on our UU values and beliefs this year. They participate in activities and crafts focused on the topic, and they created a covenant to resolve conflicts and help with behaviors and social interactions, both in the classroom and out. Seekers are spending the year exploring myths and stories from our UU sources. They're encouraged to examine their own morals, values, and decision-making processes. They begin to make connections between the worlds of science, wonder, and religion. They understand that religion helps people find answers to important questions in life and that some questions do not have answers. Questers are focused on social justice and social action. They spend time learning about issues such as hatred, hunger, illiteracy, and climate change. They've been really active this year, donating 120 pounds of food to the Delaware Food Bank, as well as serving a meal to the food insecure with From Our Kitchen. And now they're working on building free little libraries. The youth group meets every other Sunday from 12 to 2. Um, and they've been doing a lot around the church. Um, some of the things have been preparing the bake sale and the vegan chili cook-off. Youth group is led by our director of religious exploration, Catherine Williamson, along with the youth leaders. We thank everyone who's involved in making our CYRE program something to be proud of. And a big shout out to Steve Merrick, who pro provides tasty snacks for our kids. Thank you for your support of the CYRE children and youth. Well, it's essential for us to focus on what is needed for First Unitarian's future, for, for example, with our children for our, our program for our children. It's simultaneously imperative that we keep the home fires burning while we dream and build our future. Thus, I invite you to consider your gift this morning that will maintain our programs, support our wonderful staff, and keep the lights on and the heat on. During the offertory music, there will be a slide showing how to make that gift. There are two baskets, in the wicker baskets in the back where you can put your cash or your check. And there will be instructions about going online to give that way. Now please join me in dedicating our offering. Because this congregation which is weaving a tapestry of love and action. We dedicate our lives and these our offerings.
Thank you, choir. Thank you, Kathy. The chalice extinguishing that I'm going to read this morning was written for the annual communion service at General Assembly in 2022 by Phoenix Bell Shelton Biggs, who was then an intern, UU minister, studying at Meadville Lombard. If you have lit a chalice at home, I invite you to extinguish it as Reverend Larry extinguishes our sanctuary chalice, and I read these words. As we extinguish our sacred flame once more, we do so having taken part in the great feast, having called to question our doubts, our fears, having been reminded of who and whose we are, as God calls upon us to do everything in love, do justice and mercy and tread humbly. Beloveds, our sacred flame is now extinguished, but inside all of us burns a flame bright and true. That flame, that flame of the fiercest love that is our promise of universal salvation can never be extinguished. So uh, we will have a fellowship time following our closing hymn. This morning, the snacks are brought to us by our Chalice children and our Seekers class. They've made the snacks, they've prepared them, and they'll be serving them as part of their lesson on stewardship today. Um, speaking of stewardship, there will be a stewardship table in the fellowship hall, uh, or the parish hall, and those who've signed up for the restorative writing workshop today with Cassandra Lewis, it will meet in Bruner Chapel if you need help in terms of how to get there, just ask someone to direct you to the second floor. This week, other events include Poetry as a Tool for Wellness, uh, and then we also have the author of The Best We Could Do, and all of those details are in our e-news. So our closing uh, words are these by Theodore Parker. Be ours a religion which, like sunshine, goes everywhere. Its temple, all space. Its shrine, the good heart. Its creed, all truth. It's ritual, works of love. It's profession of faith, divine living. Sing together our closing hymn, Bring Many Names, on number 23. And uh, we're singing verses 1, 4, 5, and 6.
Thank you. 
Thank you. 